when we want somebody else's approval, we become susceptible to an easier answer. We do. And there's a lot of people out there that prey on that and make millions of dollars preying on people on that idea. There is no easier answer. That is the way that it's actually done, period. You talk to anybody who is actually really successful and they'll tell you that's the way that it's done. It's a decision and it's mastering something. It's doing something over and over again with the greatest passion that you can bring to something every single day in order to get that thing done. Welcome everybody, glad to talk to you today. Um, we're gonna be talking about the, the difference between a middle-class mindset and an entrepreneurial mindset um, and what it, really, what it really boils down to to create the success that you want in life. And you know, for, for a long, long time, I searched for that answer uh, myself. And it was a very interesting scenario when I was actually given that answer. Um, after a long struggle in, in my first uh, business effort and not getting where I wanted to go, I asked somebody who was way ahead of me in life, which is something that I always recommend people do, um, you know, have a coach or a mentor that is way ahead of where you are and then listen to what it is that they tell you. Um, this person basically boiled it down in a nutshell to me and told me that I didn't want it bad enough. And I remember, I remember going through an, an, a whole array of different emotions and thinking when this person said this to me because they didn't say anything else. I, I told them what the story was, I told them what trouble I was having, what problem I was having, and I was waiting to get something that um, I thought would you know, give me a better direction, you know, something. But I did not expect them to say, you just don't want it bad enough and walk away from me. And that's exactly what this person did. And when I calmed myself down uh, after thinking this person was uncaring and rude and, you know, arrogant and all this other crap that was going through my mind, I realized that it was probably the best gift that anybody ever gave to me in uh, any kind of a coaching or a mentorship situation because he cut through all the bullshit and just gave me the plain hard truth. And it was really my responsibility whether, whether I was going to hear it, um, if I was going to take that information, what I was going to do with it. It didn't, it didn't really matter because he wasn't attached to it at all. He didn't need any outcome for from, uh, from his point of view as to what he did. He told me the truth. And the truth was, I didn't want it bad enough. It was my responsibility to find out why that was, how that was showing up in my life, how that was showing up in my behavior, and then to do the work to, to change it. So I've had, I can't tell you how many thousands of people uh, really present very much the same scenario to me as far as their own success goes. And you could sit here and you could talk about the subconscious mind and the conscious mind, and you could talk about the, the skill sets and the principles. You could talk about the spiritual aspect of it. You could talk about their past. You could talk about their, their parents. You could talk about the hurts that they've had as kids. And when it comes all down to here's the success and here is a handful of excuses, the one thing that allows you to go from the excuses to the, su the success is wanting it bad enough. You have to want it bad enough to, to stop all the stories from controlling your thinking and to be willing to do whatever it takes in order to get the thing that you want. And that's really what I want to talk about today because the question then comes to, well, how do I want it bad enough? And I think that's where we need to go to work today. How do you actually want it bad enough? Because once you start to open the door where it, you start moving into all the different questions about success and then the individual aspects of what it is that you're doing in your business, um, what it is that you're doing with your day, how you're moving through different aspects of the business and different skill sets, it can get, you can go down one rabbit hole after another rabbit hole after another rabbit hole and never really climb out of it because you don't know what you're looking for. 
Now, I talked about this on a previous um, uh, episode of this, that when you don't know what you're looking for, it makes you very vulnerable to people, to other people who want to persuade you in a direction that you're more tempted to go because it actually sounds easier uh, versus what the actual truth is. And because in when you're talking about any kind of personal development at all, you're looking at something that's very difficult for most people. And I really want you to consider the impact of, of what I'm about to say here. If it was really, really easy for people to do this, you would find many, many more people had real success in their life versus people that don't. And the this part is being brutally honest with themselves, brutally honest about what's important to them, the, the, the things that they believe in, um, their own personal weaknesses. And because if a person really gets honest with themselves, it becomes very apparent as to what it is that they actually need to begin working on in those moments. It's the, it's the disillusionment that there is some easier way out there to navigate your way from a working class mindset, a middle class mindset, a mediocrity mindset, into a successful mindset. The thing is about, the thing is about success is that su success has a price. There is an absolute cost to it. There's a cost, a financial cost to it. There's a cost in time. There's a cost in discipline. There's a cost in repetition, meaning that you have to be practicing the correct things and, and, and learn the correct skill sets in order to accomplish the success because you have to be proficient in the things that you're doing. Um, there is, there is a, there's an emotional cost in the idea that the truth is, is that most people are looking for acceptance. They're looking for appreciation. They're looking for approval. And of course, there's a lot of things online today that cater toward that idea versus the actual skill sets of success itself. So people will make emotional appeals to people, telling them that there's a way to get the success through that emotional bent, through the idea of approval, through the idea of acceptance, through the idea of, of belonging. And while those things can be very important, and I think the culture of those things is very important in in certain people's lives, in certain, in certain situations, it is not the catalyst for the success that most people are looking for. Not when you're talking about the business success that you want, not when you're talking about the financial success. Because if it was, then it would be required in every situation. And it, it's not. It can be part of certain situations for sure, depending on the business that you built and the culture that you create in that business. But it is not the one thing that is actually going to get you there. The one thing that will get you where you want to go is that you have to want the thing that you say that you want more than any other thing. Because if you don't, the, the other things that you do want will become more apparent as you start to get distance from them and you begin to move toward this area of, of success itself. So, I think that the journey uh, for most people is that as you start to walk the path towards whatever it is that you say that you want to be successful, you, you come face to face with yourself. You come face to face with the world that you were taught is true, uh, the world that you grew up in, the world that other people believed in. And, you know, versus the reality, the cold, hard reality of what it actually is. So let's, let's kind of break this down a little bit. Um, you have to be willing to do what it takes. So if you're not successful, the truth is, is that anybody who's not successful and we're basically we're talking about business success right now. We're talking about your dream business business success. If you're not successful, you have no idea what it takes. Period. I think that's a first thing that a person needs to come to the table with, and really understand that they don't know what it takes. Now, 
This also would include anybody that's really given it a good shot and they've had a major failure or setback and they have not recovered from that to then move into the area of, of having that success. They would, you don't know what it takes. And if you, if you will at least admit that, the per, that you don't know what it takes, then you can be open to learning what it does. But it, it, never, it never fails to amaze me the amount of people that will listen to other people that will tell you how to get have success in their life when they have absolutely no clue because they've never actually done it themselves. Or they will tell you that there is an easier way than, than what it is that you have in your mind about it. Now, there, there are, I will say this, success has a tendency to breed success. The more money you make, the easier it actually is. But there's reasons for this. And one of the reasons is that, of course, the more you do anything, the better you get at it. And the better you get at something, generally, the easier it is because you're starting to integrate the patterns and the behaviors and the habits in order to be able to do something. So if you have to constantly make yourself do something every day that you necessarily don't want to do, or you're really learning something new, you're all in your conscious mind at that moment. And it can, and it can be very stressful. It can be very difficult. You can be battling your own mind on a consistent basis. So you have thoughts that are trying to, say, keep you in bed in the morning or not get off the couch or you have to make phone calls or you have to make contacts or you have to go out and do something that is uncomfortable and everything in your, in your body is wanting you to just you know, take it easy that day. A person who is going to become successful finds the way to overcome that voice in their head that says, that says stay the same and they do it. Um, but there's a battle that goes on there for a long period of time until a person reaches a place where they understand how to move past the battle. Moving past the battle is simply this. It's a decision that takes place in the mind where I think a person reaches some kind of a, either an, a, a frustration or an understanding that they are creating this battle inside of themselves. And they're not willing to entertain that voice anymore. It doesn't mean that it completely goes away. What it means is that in that moment of that decision for that person, when they really wake up to this idea, that they kind of disempower that voice because they decide they're no longer going to, they're no longer going to listen to it. Now, there's something important here. If you're constantly fighting that voice, Think about this for a minute. That voice is coming from inside of yourself. Um, you're generating that voice. It could be the voice of your mom or your dad or some teacher when you were a kid that told you that you weren't good enough to do something, but it's still coming from within you. So you have a relationship with this part of yourself, with that, with that being, so to speak, with that ideology. Um, with those past habits, with that belief system. And the struggle is walking away from it. The, the struggle is ending that relationship. And I think that that's when it starts to become easier as far as the internal game goes, is that when we're, when we're willing to walk away from that relationship. But for most people, and sometimes with, all, and sometimes with a lot of people that never happens, is that you have to be ready to say, I'm no longer going to be in a relationship with that side of myself. I'm going to move over completely into the relationship of who I want to become. And that's all I'm actually going to focus on. Now, what the, you might want to write that down because that's when you go from real struggle over into a true spirit of winning. That's where you really move into an entrepreneurial mindset. Because it's whatever reason you're holding on to that relationship of that other person inside of yourself, whatever that reason is for you, in that moment, that reason is more important than stepping into who you can become. Now, another thing that I think is pretty important is to understand that the person that you want to become is also inside of you. That's not external, although you may see external representations of that in other people as far as 
their behavior or something that you admire in someone else, even if like so there's something that you're envious of or you're jealous of, of another person, those are probably all qualities that exist in you in some way. You resonate with them on some level. So the idea is to understand that all that is is a mirror reflection of something that's laying dormant inside of yourself, and but it's still in you, right? It's still in you. So the idea is that you start to develop a relationship with that person and let go of the relationship with the one you know. So you want to become the one that is trying to stand up inside of you and say, hey, listen, you can become this, but that, that relationship needs all of your attention and the, and the old one has to, has to be let go. It's really that attachment to that old self that you have to be willing to walk away from. So you, what's interesting is that you will see that even when it comes down to people who, let's say you have a lot of trauma in your life, a lot of backstory in your life, uh, you've overcome a lot of things in your life, or you were put through a lot uh, in your younger years, you're not going to find a whole lot of people that, that don't have some of that in their life. Like everybody's been through something. We all go through, through things in our life. I think the question comes down to what do you take all of that? What do you do with all of that? And how does it show up in your life currently? And what are you going to turn it into as you move forward in your life? It's very important to understand that we don't want the past to go away. We want it to be a story that instead of you know, basically having us be disempowered and not do anything with our life, that it's actually something that we take and reframe in our mind so that it, so that it empowers us. Everything in your past has been 100% necessary for you to be the person that you are today. And to wish it away or wish that it didn't happen is to really kind of disassociate yourself with the true gift that is in our past and turn it in a direction where we want to go. So when we talk about the difference between um, an entrepreneur and the difference between the middle class or the mediocre or the working class, the foundational idea that is in the middle class mindset is safety. That's the foundation. It's safety. It, everything is tied together in the brain, uh, the connections that are actually made, not only in how we think, but how we observe our world has to do with security. And I think people get that really confused sometimes because they'll say, listen, I'm not trying to do this. I'm actually miserable or I don't like my life the way that it is. When you say I don't like something, you're basically giving a conscious voice to some kind of an unconscious experience. So you may not, it may not make you happy in the moment, but if it is keeping you in the known the known of your world, the known of your life, that is something that you know how to deal with. And even if, it's a, even if it's not something that we like, if we know how to deal with it over and over and over again, there is a degree of certainty that comes from that. And for most individuals, they don't like uncertainty. Well, you cannot become successful without understanding and navigating uncertainty in your life. It has to be something that you can fully step into and you can do it in a way where you embrace it, where it excites you, where you see opportunity and possibility versus all the things that can go wrong from a, a position of, um, of permanence. Meaning that a lot of people in the middle class will look at uncertainty and they will look at say risk taking and there's big absolutes in their mind around it, meaning that they look at the what ifs. What if I fail? What if I go bankrupt? What if it doesn't work? <clears throat> what if I give up this job and I give up you know, my insurance? All the different things that we hear about reasons to hold on to something that's not really serving us and not move forward, the what ifs have nothing connected to it except generally in their minds, it's like utter catastrophe. Like there's no coming back from it. There's no turning it around. It's, it's absolute. It's forever. It's forever. It's for a, a forever failure. And then there's the unspoken idea behind that, which is all the people that are in your life who would actually see you 
fail at some degree. And the I told you so's and people making fun of you or people walking away from you because they don't agree with you, like all of that represents a tremendous amount of pain for a lot of individuals. If we understand that, we also understand that those individuals in our past, most of the individuals in our families, most of the individuals, <clears throat> excuse me, that were around, that have been around most of our life, if they have not gone after their dreams, there's no way they can understand anybody else going after theirs. And literally, when they look at people that are very successful, they really don't have a logical explanation in their mind as how that person became successful. Because we don't generally see how a person becomes successful. We just see them when they become successful. So then we label them as gifted or talented or lucky, or they knew someone, or they were already wealthy. It's like we give these examples that don't have any cause and effect relationship as far as how they became successful. They're, they're just these enigmas that exist. And here's what we know. We're, not, we're absolutely not one of them because we can verify uh, what we have based on what our reality is. <clears throat> and that can be struggle, that can be money, that can be generations of, of working class individuals, but we're definitely not that because all we see is what we've been taught about successful people and is they have something that we don't have. And what the only thing about that is true is that they've made a decision to do whatever it's necessary in order for them to be successful. But now you have something else that I find very interesting. Not only do the middle class have these absolute ideas about success and failure and people who are successful and how they got there. But there's also the stories that we hear about the tragedies of success. And I think this is absolutely fascinating because you don't hear, if you hear, if you hear somebody who's not successful and they're talking about successful people and then the tragedies that some successful people have had in their life, they talk about it as if the success caused those tragedies. But you could look at people that aren't successful and they have the same tragedies in their life. So they're really not related at all. I mean, it's true that a successful person might have more money and they may have a, you know, a bigger a tragedy because they make more money or maybe, the, maybe because they're famous and everybody knows, something like that. But people that aren't successful make the same kinds of mistakes and errors in their life. They get go down the same wrong roads in their life. So that it, there, there's no correlation there really between the two. And of course, then you have the biggest one, which is that money won't make you happy. Success won't make you happy. You hear about people who've interviewed all these successful people, and then they say, I never really met one that wasn't happy. So happiness doesn't even have a whole lot to do with it because you can find all kinds of broke people that aren't happy. But that's not the story we hear either. We hear people tell stories of how they go to poverty-ridden ridden countries or they go into the ghettos and they say, but everybody was happy. And it's like, what kind of bullshit are you peddling, right? Because it, it po neither poverty nor success has anything to do with a person being happy. Happiness is a choice and happiness is a way of looking at a person's life or the world and really choosing, either consciously or unconsciously, that they're going to find things to be happy about in their life. It's a, it's a way of looking at things. That's why in the beginning of, of the, the calls that I've been doing, I talked so much about gratitude. Uh, because gratitude keeps you looking at the things that you're grateful for. It keeps you looking at the, at the good things that are, that are in your life. But if that's all we hear over a long period of time or when we're growing up, we have, an, we have a, a, an, an alternative argument going in our mind as why we shouldn't be there. Because when it gets really tough, I hear people say, well, you know what? I mean, I gave it a really good try and, you know, success isn't going to make me happy anyway. And, you know, we might end up losing everything or, you know, what if something happens now like the COVID virus and we lose everything? Like you hear all different kinds of stories about the reasons why not to go after it. And it really can get, it can get very foggy. It can get really confusing when all of that stuff 
starts to enter into your mind. So the idea is that we have to get to the place where we really want that end result more than anything else. And that means more than what other people think about us. That means more than that other side of ourself actually thinks about it and be willing to let go of that and move into the direction of what we really want for our life. So let's, let's work on getting clear on that. So hopefully you can walk away from this. And then when we get to the Q&A, you're happy to a I'll answer questions on it. But when you walk away today, I hope the idea is that you can sit down and you can really kind of start to unravel for yourself what is that burning desire that you have for yourself. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to clear one other thing up here before I go into the, into the whiteboard. It doesn't have to necessarily be a spiritual answer. And the reason that I say that is if you've like, if you followed me for any period of time, you know that I bring spirituality or energy into what I teach. And one of the reasons that I do that is because it was a huge conflict for me as a kid and when I was really young. Um, and I wanted to know those answers. I wanted to know how does spirituality fit into, or does it even fit into, success? I, I wanted to know the answer because I had so many um, opposing ideas going on. But there's been all kinds of people that have been successful that aren't necessarily spiritual people in the conscious sense of being a spiritual person, nor do they actually practice any kind of religion or spirituality to speak of. So that's also not something that is 100% necessary in order to be in your consciousness to have the success that you want. It can be, I think it's a good thing, but I also think it can be a big trap for a lot of individuals because just like anything else that we start to look at, if you start to open the spiritual door when it comes to success, you could end up down a lot of rabbit holes that are nothing but that. They're just rabbit holes. And I, I see people constantly going after, I'm, you know, I want to go to the deeper thing. I want to go to the deeper thing. I want to go to the deeper thing. And if you sit around and talk to them long enough, you, you start to think to yourself, what is it that this person's actually looking for? Um, I mean, there's peace, there's happiness, there's love, there's, there's family, right? Um, there's business, and then there's contribution. And I think, that, I think that we have to be very careful to make sure that we stay in a place where we can still contribute to the world, because that's why we're here. If we start to move into a place where we don't contribute, we're making a huge error because all life contributes to life. And it's almost like if you go down too many of these rabbit holes spiritually, you get into a place of non-contribution. And I don't think, I don't think that's my, my opinion that, that we're not here to not contribute. We're here to contribute. So the whole idea is that all the information that I'm taking in, all the work that I'm doing on myself is going to allow me to contribute at a higher level or a deeper level or a way where it, it, it benefits others and myself more, not where I'm withdrawing from the world and just going into this little bubble, this little spiritual bubble where nothing can touch me. The idea is that spirituality should bring truth to your life as to why you can go out in the world and all of the things that touch most people won't touch you, meaning that you become emotionally, spiritually mature enough to go out in the world where there is, there, there are lots of toxic people, there's lots of dysfunction out there, there's lots of problems, but you don't take that energy on personally in a way where it actually has something to do with you where you become a, a person that can't contribute because you're so overwhelmed by everybody else's pain that you can't get out of your own way. And of course, all that is, is a reflection of your own pain. So that means that there's a lot of people searching for spirituality that are really, what they're really looking for is they're looking for other wounded people that they can harmonize with as an excuse not to do anything. So there's probably a lot of people on here right now thinking, uh, bullshit. Well, it's not bullshit. You'll, if, you, if you get involved in it long enough, you will see that there's that whole bent of spirituality 
that becomes very impotent in the world. They're not doing anything except talking about how they need to stay in this little bubble themselves, but they're not really contributing in any way. And they literally become like a raw nerve out there because anything that comes to them that is not part of that bubble, it just, it offends them so bad that they, they literally can't function. So that's not, I don't think that's what spirituality is supposed to be for anybody. It's supposed to, you know, not only ground us, but, but make us alive to the world and how we can help and not be stuck in, in that as a dysfunction, just like any, anything else can also be a dysfunction. All right, so let's take a look at this here. Let's get to the whiteboard. We have to understand that when we're growing up, we are constantly given a ton of information on how to represent ourselves in the world and what all the different things in the world represent to us. And the question is underneath, underneath what it is that we're being taught, what is the reason that we're being taught these things? So most of the way that the world is set up is so that we basically are maybe one foot away from, actually maybe a little bit further than that, but not much, from survival. The idea is how do we grow up and be independent adults where we can go out there and take care of ourselves, where we can go out there and survive. Um, so that's what we're taught. We're taught how to be safe as little kids. And then we have to move into conformity, which is where we start to go to school and we're around all these other little kids and a bunch of them. And you have a few people that are teaching these children the basics of, of education. Now, when you're teaching a lot of people at one time and the whole idea is really to take a bunch of kids and keep moving them progressively in a direction, we have to get that information into their heads so that they can remember it, they can read it, remember it, repeat it back in the tests. We say they know it, we pass them on to the next uh, grade and, and they keep going. So they get more information, more information, more information, more information. So they have all of this information and then at some point in their life, uh, hopefully the information turns into some kind of a skill set that they can go out and they can, they can get a job doing whatever it is that they supposedly like. But that's really not how the educational system is set up to go out there and do what they like. They look at test scores, they look at behavior, they look at what the kid is doing well in or not doing well in, and then the teachers direct that person into some field that they think that they could possibly make a living at, and then it's off, there you go. Like, go, in, go, into, that, go into that living and live your life. And then they move into getting married, they move into having kids, you know, they move into the family and they start to go down that road. And very often we find ourselves at some point going, what is this? Like, what is this life that I'm actually living? Well, if we look here, we've got two things going on simultaneously. So you've got safety, which is basically certainty. It's survival, right? So you have safety, certainty, and survival. And that's the underlying idea for the way that most people are raised. And the truth is, is that most of the world's population lives in poverty. Um, and they're right on the, they're right in survival on a, on a daily basis. Many, many people that live working class, middle class lives, um, the only thing that keeps them from being in, say, like a poverty survival is the system. And th if we look at what happened with this virus, it's, I think it's really kind of a fascinating wake-up call for everybody. Because it's the system it's that, that we live in, that we're, uh, that we're conditioned to live in, that kind of supports us, from most people anyway, from going too far down into into literally just living for survival, like living on a dirt floor, um, you know, trying to figure out where the hell they're going to get food every day. And, and, and there's so many people in the world that actually live like this. So I'm basically talking about North America and any other countries uh, that live like we do. We created a system that keeps most people from dropping down into that level of poverty. You're only required to do a few things specifically, which is what our educational system actually does, to hold a person into that system. 
And as long as we're part of that system, we're okay. Uh, but the people that are in that system don't really understand that it's not as much themselves as it is the system that's actually supporting them in the way that they're living. And they think they're actually free, but really they're not because they've bought into a major, major lie, something that is completely not true. And it takes something like the COVID virus to actually show us how untrue it actually is. Look at it like this. The government would not be scrambling to put together packages uh, worth billions and trillions of dollars for individuals if the system uh, wasn't so fragile, right? Because instantly when something like this happens and they have to tell people that they can't work, in other words, we have to pull you out of the system, now we become extremely vulnerable to the way that we live because the way that we live has changed. So then it's like, well, now what do I do, right? Well, if you don't know how to be resourceful because you've never really had to be resourceful before, then you have people that go into paralysis because they can't think out of the situation. Why can't they think out of the situation? Because safety and certainty is what's actually flooding their mind. And we're literally wired with safety. So that means that even though, even though we think we have these these freedoms to choose between different things, all of those choices are basically linked to how am I going to be safe in the world? How's my family going to be safe in the world? How's my house going to be safe in the world? How's my car going to be safe in the world? How are my pets going to be safe in the world? And we, and we have that knowledge that gets linked up to that idea. And then we have the thing that allows us to be safe, okay? That is whatever the distribution method is, it's whatever the program is, it's whatever the job is, it's whatever the healthcare system is, whatever system, whatever thing it is, if we can operate within that, it allows us to maintain a certain level of certainty and a certain level of safety. But if it's taken away, the mind doesn't know what to do because it's looking for the system that we can step into where we're actually going to feel safe again. And then if the pressure comes off where we're actually feeling safe, then the person has the kind of like the freedom of thought starts to begin to move in that person's mind again. So what they're, then they start looking at is between different choices they can make within that system of safety. So it's important that we recognize that this is actually going on uh, and it may be like for you personally, uh, it could be going on for you right now. But there's a, di there's a big difference here because I think this is an exacerbated or exaggerated way to look at how the working class, middle class lifestyle live their entire life. They live within this system that gives them various different choices. There's, there's I mean, that's 100% true. There's lots of different choices that a person can choose from in their lifetime. And I mean, people make billions of dollars a year, millions of dollars a year on creating things that provide choices for these individuals, but basically they're distractions. This is where the truth about distractions becomes very relevant because what does it distract a person from? Well, it distracts a person from actually looking at the fact that they're really not in charge of their life at the moment. Um, the system is in charge of their life. And their choice is where within the system are they going to make choices to get to the end of their life? And that's it. So like my mentor used to say, most of us, what we really want to do is we want to tiptoe tip -toe through life, hoping to make it safely to death without you know, too many things going wrong or bad. And even with the wrong, even with the bad things that happen in every person's life, it's all about how do we get back to safety? How do we get back to some kind of normalcy? How do we get back to some kind of certainty? So most people are not really taking very many big risks with their life, even though they may feel like that within the choices that they're making. There's not a lot of uncertainty uh, in those systems. And if a system does come down that proves not to be that good and a bunch of people get hurt, uh, those systems get crucified pretty bad in the, in the public view. Like we see that 
happen with businesses. We see it happen with banks. We see it happen with industries and organizations all, all the time. Something goes wrong uh, for whatever reason. It doesn't really matter what the reason is, but something goes wrong. And a bunch of people become victims of that thing going wrong. And then uh, they blame the thing. And then that is crucified and either they're helped or they're not helped. But the, but the, but the truth is, is that it, be, it becomes a, a big victim mindset at that point. So we even want our systems to be secure so that nobody can, nobody can get hurt. Like as little, as little as possible for people to get hurt. And I think from like, you know, from an empathetic perspective, uh, that, that's a good thing. Like we don't want people necessarily to get hurt. But it's very difficult to offer one thing without taking away something else. Meaning that if you're constantly going to sell people on safety, then the tendency is that that person's going to buy into the safety as the end game of whatever it is that they're doing. And they're not going to be in the, the, the expanded mindset of what they can actually do for their life. Because the truth is there really is no safety. Um, like there, there, there is, there is none in the sense that safety is an absolute and that does not exist. That is a complete illusion that millions, if not billions of people actually buy into what, what can keep you safe in a moment of time is your ability to react to whatever is happening in a way where you can not only survive, but you can thrive in that moment. Do we have the flexibility of thought? Do we have the emotional maturity? Do we have the resourcefulness in us to be able to adapt to whatever happens so that we can continue to move forward? And many people don't. Many people really don't. Because the tighter that system gets squeezed, the more they see of what they're losing and what they can't do. So right now is a huge magnifying glass for what many people look at every day that prevents them from success because that actually in, in when things are normal in the world, a lot of people moving towards success, what's happening with the virus actually happens in a person's mind. They see everything that resembles safety kind of possibly disappearing in their life. And then they go into then what, or what if, and they have no answer for that because they've never had to be really resourceful in their life. So they're, what they're really looking for unconsciously is they're looking, for the, they're looking for the safety again. So the idea here is that if we can become aware that this is such a big pull for so many people, we can also become aware that really when I say you don't want it bad enough, what you do want bad enough is you want the safety. That's ultimately what everybody's looking for, safety certainty, right? That's what I realized when that mentor of mine said to me, he said, hey, David, you don't want it bad enough. And he turned around and walked away from me. And I was pissed. Man, I can't tell you how pissed I was. I mean, fuming pissed. Um, I had to really look at like, okay, if that's true, where would that show up in my life? And when I realized, and this was like, I was driving home from this conference where this guy said this to me, and I literally pulled over on the side of the road. And all of a sudden it was like, this vision opened up in front of me and I could see all of my behaviors in my business and how I was only going so far with them. And because what I really was doing was I wanted to be safe and certain, but I didn't know that. I thought I was really going out there and giving it everything that I could. I was giving it everything I could within the bubble of safety. If it got, if it got, if it resembled anything that had risk, I would back away. But in that moment, I, if you just said that to me, I would have told you, no, that's not happening. I'm like, I'm, I'm giving it everything that I can. I'm giving 100% every single day in what I'm doing. But I was not moving into the place where there was, where there was really any risk. Now, risk of what? That's what we need to ask. Risk of what? And this is different for every person. So for me, it was risk of what other people think. I did not realize I was moving away from any kind of risk of what other people think. Now, here's something that's very important because this is true for many, many people that are moving from middle-class mindset and they want to become entrepreneurs. 
we're indoctrinated to live our lives based on what other people think. It is just drilled into our mind, left and right, day and night, in school, in religion, in, in society, in our, uh, um, in our homes. It is, it is really just planted in our mind. Our security, part of our security, is very much, the way that we feel certain about it, is very much dependent upon what other people think. And it's very much dependent upon what other people think that we hold near and dear to ourselves. So if we do something to cause those individuals to think less of us, we're actually removing how certain or safe we feel in this world. But we probably don't know that's what's happening. All we know is that whatever the criticism is that we get from another individual doesn't feel good. But we don't know why it doesn't feel good, right? We really don't know. When we're born, when we're, when we're in this little babies in this world, if, uh, if, if, let's say your mom or your dad, I'm talking about now you're an infant, and they were to criticize you for food drooling down your face or whatever, you wouldn't think anything of it. Like, you wouldn't even be able to understand what the hell they were saying because you haven't learned a language yet. So it wouldn't have any effect on you whatsoever. That idea of when it does affect you is literally drilled in by cause and effect of us needing the acceptance of our parents in our behavior. So as we start to build that relationship up, when, when our relationship with our parents or anybody else is built on the acceptable behavior and then when your behavior is unacceptable, they cut off that feeling of safety or security, which means you don't feel loved or accepted in that moment because mom or dad is pissed or you've been disciplined for something. If that happens out of balance in a person's life, which it does, it happens out of balance in most people's lives. And that isn't even talking about somebody who's been abused or somebody that had toxic parents. That's just in the average family because this is the way that people are taught to stay in line in society. We see it in school, we see it in religion, we see it in politics, we see it in government, we see it everywhere. We need somebody else's approval, not just to feel good about ourselves, but very often to advance. So literally, our position in the world, our position in our life, and as a little kid is put into the hands of another person that we say is in authority of us. And that person has the right to then say whether we can move forward or we have to stay the same or we have to go down. And for probably like the first 20 years of your life, that's reality, right? A teacher has the ability to promote you or, or keep you in the class. A parent has the ability to give you some freedom in your life or withdraw that freedom. So it, it, is, it is very much in the hands of another adult entrepreneurs do something very unique. At some point in their life, and it's different for every one of them, they take that authority back. Either it was never there, and in some cases it wasn't, but in some cases it wasn't for a lot of people. It doesn't necessarily make them an entrepreneur. But for entrepreneurs specifically, at some point, they take that authority back and they realize they're not going to become what they want to be. And this is really for, for anybody that goes out there and lives their dream. They have to take that authority back for themselves. Now, why are they taking it back? Because this gets into what do you want more? Do you want success or do you actually want safety? And that's where we have, we have this. We have this desire that every person is going to toward. Now, um, so I'm gonna, I wanna teach this, this part here in a generic, a generic form, so to speak. Meaning that, I want to remove the psychological or spiritual right and wrong, not ethical, but psychological or spiritual right and wrong uh, from the foundation of this conversation, because I think that it, it makes it too murky for a person to really grasp onto, right? Because there, you have to admit, when it comes to psychology, when it comes to spirituality, there is a, there's a heavier bent on the well-being of the person than there is on the success. And I'm not I'm not downplaying the well-being of a person. I think it's, it's very important. But those two things don't necessarily go together in the outcome that most people are actually looking for. And here's what I mean by that. When we were kids, whatever it is that we were being programmed with, 
I believe it's how that information was interpreted that determines how much of a success we're going to be as an adult, okay? So you can take, you can take a kid that gets a lot of criticism as a, as a, as a kid, as a child, while they're, they're growing up. They get a lot of criticism, and it, it's, it, let's say it's not even warranted, right? They just had an overly critical parent. They had a parent that teased them, a parent that made fun of them. Um, a, a parent that, that, that pitted you know, one sibling uh, against the other. So the one that was, let's say, uh, uh, that got picked on the most, okay? That kid can internalize that is that they're going, that's going to become their superpower. Like they're going to go out in the world and they're never going to be denied their success again. Like their parents told them they couldn't have anything. Their brothers and sisters told them they couldn't have anything. Their teachers, their coaches, when they were in school, told them that they weren't good enough. And what they did was they internalized it as they were going to go out and be better than anybody. Like they were going to be the greatest in whatever they did. And a very famous person that everybody knows that has done that's Michael Jordan. When Michael Jordan was a kid, his father used to make fun of him because he did not, he was not mechanically inclined. He didn't understand what different wrenches were and stuff like that. And he would try to help out on the car when he was a kid and his dad said, you're not going to be anything. Go back in the house with your mother. Go back in the house with the women. And he would tease him about those things relentlessly. He turned those things into, I'm going to win. Nobody's ever going to do that to me again. And of course, he became the grand, greatest basketball player ever out of it. So he, took, he did something positive with it. See, if we bring the spiritual aspect in there, we can like debate this all day long. Was it right? Was it wrong? Did, does Michael really know himself? You know, is he happy with himself? You know, we can go into all that stuff, but not for this conversation because we, where we end up with it is nowhere. So now let's take the same person and they get the same criticism, but they internalize it in a different way and they're going to take that anger out on people. So then you go in and you end up with school shootings and criminals and, and um, all kinds of behavior that, that goes into, into that direction in life. And the person ends up in jail forever or whatever. Same situation, but the person internalized it one way versus the other. Now, you have to ask yourself for your own life, the things that you, the things that you learned as a kid, the experiences that you had, how did you internalize those? Because I'm going to tell you the worst one. The worst one is mediocrity. The worst one was that I don't care what the experiences were, but your wiring, the way you wired that up was to do nothing. Not necessarily be a loser and not necessarily go out and take the world on fire either, but really not to do anything. Like that was, that was the road that you chose in your life. Because if you did, then the problem that you have is that unconsciously you're looking for the escape of nothing. At least if you're on one of the extremes, you're awake to the extreme, but the people in the middle are very often not awake to anything. Why are they not awake to anything? Well, there's not too much pain on one side saying, hey, dummy, wake the hell up. You're fucking your life up. And there's not enough of the other on the other side where maybe it's even out of balance where they need to bring something in check. But it's an exaggerated mirror of either side. So it's shining more of a light on their life. This person in the middle is in a complete fog and everybody around them is in a complete fog, and they're all moving together from one fog of a decision to another fog, and they never get out of each other's way. And so this person's like with a fog light or a fog horn, they're trying to find, they're trying to find success. And when they shine that light out to try to find it, it just comes back in their eyes and blinds them, and they can't really see their way. So the key is, is to really, 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 really Get clear on why you want the things that you say that you want. The people that are in this situation, they're in the middle. The biggest problem that I see, the, the place to take your attention away from, is when you're really looking for a mass amount of people to say that you're good enough. Um, because if a person's looking for that and they're wired with mediocrity, their, their whole strategy in life is to be a massive people pleaser, but not in a way 
that is actually going to take them out of the situation that they're in. It's not going to take them out of the middle at all. So they're going to try to find their way to that extreme being in the middle and they never get, they never get anywhere. This is a person who will spend you know, forever in spirituality, they'll stay forever. They'll go from one self-improvement program to another, to another, to another, from one coach to another, to another, to another, from one book to another, to another, to another. And they never really make any progress at all. The real truth is if a person wants it bad enough, they will take whatever information they, they've got and they will work it until it produces a different result in their life. But the whole key to this is to be brutally honest with yourself about who you really are and what it is that's actually motivating you. Um, and you have to be willing to say, I want to be successful because I want to be fucking rich. I want to be successful because I want to be famous. I want to be successful because I want to have a massive business. I want to be successful because whatever, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It only matters what you think. And I find that most people are not willing to do that because they say, well, I don't want to say I want to be successful because I want to be rich because then people think I'm greedy. Well, then you're never going to be rich. If you're worried about what other people think now, imagine when you start to get there, or if you were to start to get there, what that would do, what other people would actually think, what that would actually do to you. So you have to, whatever the reason is, I don't care how dysfunctional it may seem, you need to own it. You can worry and work on any dysfunction later, but whatever the reason is, you've got to own it. And for most people, that initial pain in a person's life that they're actually taking the idea of success, whatever they're really driven to, to do, that can be worked on along the way. There's absolutely no question about that. But you have to be willing to just say what it is for yourself. And most people are working away from something at first versus towards something. If you really break down what a lot of people are doing, it's the pain of being in poverty or the pain of being in mediocrity or the pain of a bad family. And what they're doing is they have linked up in their mind to work their way away from that thing and to create something new. They don't know what the new is, but it's got to be better than what the bad was. And I think that's okay. I think that's perfectly okay because they're on a path. They're on a path to growth. It is not staying the same. It's not the same mediocrity that most people take. But if you, if you get disillusioned and you start buying into what other people are telling you, like you can be successful and basically do the same thing that you're doing now, or that there's an easier way by being spiritual, it's all bullshit. It's complete bullshit. It is complete bullshit. There is no new way out there. People that are told, that'll tell you, oh, here's the new way, here's a new guru, here's a new blah, blah, blah. It's not new. It's not new. Like you may have not been exposed to it before, it may be new for you, but it's not, overall, it's not new, right? Everything that's out there right now is a rehash of something else. Um, I guarantee you, if you do the research, you can find it online someplace in the past or someplace in, in our past history. It's definitely not new. What makes a person successful is the same thing that's always made a person successful. They make a decision, they're determined, and they master something. They work day and night, night and day. They put their resources, they put their time, they put their blood, their sweat, and their tears into something, and they're passionate about it, and they master it, and they, they, they leave excuses on the floor, and it ain't happening, right? It's not happening, not losing. I'm going to figure this out, and I'm going to keep moving forward until I figure this damn thing out. When we want somebody else's approval, we become susceptible to an easier answer. We do. And there's a lot of people out there that prey on that and make millions of dollars preying on people on that idea. There is no easier answer. That is the way that it's actually done, period. You talk to anybody who is actually really successful and they'll tell you that's the way that it's done. It's a decision and it's mastering something. It's doing something over and over again with the greatest passion that you can bring to something every single day in order to get that thing done. They're willing to learn. They're willing to move forward. They're willing to ask for help. They're willing to be uncertain. And they're willing to go out there and, and experience life. And it's kind of like, if I fuck up, so what? Who cares? I'll start again tomorrow. 
what, what else are you going to do? Like, seriously, what else are you going to do? You're going to do the same job day after day after day after day and never, and nothing ever changes? That you, like, it's one thing if you have a job, but you know that that's what you're supposed to be doing, right? Like when I, for seven years, I worked for a petroleum company. I was studying during that seven years, but during that seven years, I knew I was supposed to be in that job. That job taught me a tremendous amount about a lot of things. I had a lot of growing up to do in those seven years I was working for that company. I didn't think I was supposed to be someplace else. I knew that someday I would, but in that time, I needed to work at that job and be the best person in that job that I could, and I did. And I also needed to study for where I was going because I didn't have emotional maturity. I didn't, I didn't finish high school, I quit high school. So there was a lot that I didn't learn that I needed to learn, but I used every minute of that time to be able to prepare myself to walk away and start a company and then and basically bootstrap it and build that damn thing that it's now been going for over 20 years and to keep and continue to keep making that move forward and i had to i had to face that that question constantly in my life because once that guy woke me up to that question it always became it always became baseline for me and it's still baseline today like you, everything that i teach and all the things the different things i know when it comes right down to it, I ask myself a question, do I want it bad enough? Because I know exactly what wanting it bad enough means. It means working your ass off until you get, until you get it done, no matter what. It means sacrifice. It means working hard. It means asking for help. It means making more money. It means investing more money. It means developing relationships. It means thinking outside of the box. It means taking risks. It means standing up and being a leader and being influential and help influencing people into the things that they want to get out of life. If you're concerned about what other people think, you're not going to be a person of influence. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a person of influence. You have to be able to influence your clients, your customers, your employees, the people that you work with. And you can't do that if you don't know who you are, if you're too worried about what other people think, because you'll be too worried that you'll piss somebody off or you'll say the wrong thing or you do the wrong thing or you upset the apple cart and people will get mad and people will leave. You will never get the things that you want in life until you really admit to yourself why you want the success that you want. And it has to be a personal, selfish reason. I don't want to hear, like, I want to save the world. I want to do it. No, uh-uh. It doesn't work that way. It really doesn't. You may do something that saves the world. You may be a, a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs or a Martin Luther King or whatever, but I'll guarantee you this. It starts off with the selfish reason why you're doing something because all nature is selfish to itself. In that selfishness, it actually gives back, right? So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that it, it, nature is always looking for what it needs to survive. The only form of nature that doesn't get that, though, is human beings, because human beings have this conscious choice where we get ethics mixed up with the idea that uh, certain transactions are supposed to happen in order for life to actually expand, right? You don't see anything in nature not take and give, take and give, take and give. That's what keeps nature consistently moving forward. With human beings, though, when we get that screwed up in our mind, very often we'll take, 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 take and not give, or we'll give, 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 and not receive, which is no good either, or any kind of variation in there. But you can't know where the hell you're going if you don't know what you want. That's why I'm saying selfish, right? Because you have to understand what you want for you. How are you going to know what to work on? How are you going to know what to invest in? The first investment, forget investing in a business, you got to invest in yourself. You have to get yourself to the place where you have the skill sets to go out and do a business, to be an entrepreneur. And that means stepping into it and understanding, what do I spend my money on? What do I spend my day doing? What is the smart investment? What skill set do I actually need to develop in myself in order to become the person that I actually want to become? So that's selfish. You need to know what to focus on for you first. When we spend 20 years, 25 years, being raised by somebody to be something for somebody else, and we've never focused on who we are, we have to start over. So yeah, to the outside world, when you're starting over at 35 and you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars on your own development, people are looking at you like, hey, you got a family, man. You're like, don't you think that's selfish? 
Yeah, it is. It's selfish. But if I don't ever figure out what the hell got me the way that I am, I'm never going to be able to lead this whole family out of this situation. And then I'm doomed, my kids are doomed, and their kids are probably doomed. You have to be selfish in order to figure out where the hell you're going to go and what it is that you're going to do so that you can get your head on straight and learn the way that you think and stop having so many damn people influence you in their mediocrity, and then nobody moves anywhere at all. All right, Steph, that's my pedestal for today. So if you want to open it up for questions, I'll be happy to do so. <laughs> that was the most lovely soapbox ever, David. <laughs> All right, if you have questions, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. And while you're doing that, I have a really, really exciting announcement. I told David I've been excited all day today. Yes, um, as some of you know, we were supposed to be traveling to Atlanta next week to host David's Art of Success Summit for about 250 people. And due to COVID-19, um, the hotel canceled, we had to postpone, we've moved the dates to October. But instead, we decided to host a three-day watch party May 6th, 7th, and 8th. And those of you who, ha who had already registered to attend May Artist Success Summit, you're already included. So there's nothing that you need to do. You'll get information on it in your inbox this week. Those of you who would like to attend the watch party can. And here's what we're doing. Each watch party ticket, and it's good for all three days, is $97. And 100% of the $97 is going to purchase face shields for a hospital in New York City. So $97 purchases 15 face shields. And our company, Life is Now and David, has a goal of being able to pur purchase 3,000 face shields, which sounds like a lot, but they're all disposable. So they're single or double use face shields and there's a huge shortage. We made this announcement last week. I sent out two emails, and so far we've been able to purchase 795 face shields, which means we have, what, little less than 1,300 to go to hit our goal. And we wanted to let you know that if you'd like to join us for three days, May 6th, 7th, and 8th, from noon until 2.30 Eastern, Sarah's gonna post the link in chat if she hasn't already. And if you can't be there one or two or even all three of the days, you will get access to a replay and it's not going to go away. So I'm not going to expire a replay. You'll get the replay. You can download it onto your own advice and keep it for as long as you want. But day one, David's going to cover how to master your own psychology. So he's going to be talking about beliefs. Day two, he's going to be covering the laws. So he's going to go into each law. And then on day three, he's going to help you create a plan. So it's called mastering your own success because if you don't have a plan, it's really hard to be successful. And he's also going to open up for Q&A at the end of each of those, those sessions. So if you, you want to get additional questions answered or receive some laser coaching, he's going to open up the lines and we'll take your questions and hopefully help as many people as we can. So again, it's May 6th through the 8th. Sarah has posted the link. Just go ahead and click on it. You'll see there's a little link to, to buy. All of your $97 less the, pro the credit card fees, because we don't actually get those, the credit card fees goes to purchasing face shields for um, one of the New York City hospitals, which is super fun and exciting. Okay, ready to take questions, David? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, here ready. we go. Question number one. David, hi there. This is from Bria. I work full-time for a corporation. I've been working remotely due to lockdown. I absolutely enjoy working from home. How can I structure a conversation with my director to shift from showing up at work to working remotely? I'm even willing to work remotely at half the salary. Um, so, well, I think part of the idea is that you know, what is it that you're, what, what do they need from you? Like, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what they need from you. And, you know, do you have the ability to do it at home? I would imagine so if you're doing it now. So I would just say that this is what you want. I would just say, this is what you want. Here's what you can do. Hopefully, uh, because of the lockdown, it's actually showing that you can do it, which I think is, I think there's a lot of people, Steph, that are going to be in a position where they, they like this. They actually want to be able to do it, but their companies never thought that they could do it before. So you might actually be pretty surprised. Here's, here's what I believe. Anytime you want something, just go to the people that you need to talk to and put it out on the table. Be totally honest with them. Tell them why. Tell them what you can do and, and ask. That's it. Just be totally honest. 
Okay, thanks, David. Yeah. Next question is coming from Patty. And just a reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A so I don't, they don't, they get lost in the, in the chat. All right, this question is from Patty. I tell myself if I really wanted to, I could be successful because I have been in the past in sales. But now that thought alone stops me from taking action and getting into sales again. Can you please comment on this? Yeah, the question is, what do you want? It, because it's not just success. Success has to be de defined per the individual. Um, when, when I wanted to be successful, I knew exactly what it was. I knew exactly the amount of money I wanted to make. I had a really good idea of what I could see myself doing, who I would be around, the house that I would be living in. Like I made a vision board um, that had everything on it that I could possibly dream of that I really, really wanted. And I, you know, it was in a period of like seven, eight years. I had everything that was on that, on that dream board. Um, I think it's very important that an individual knows why and what it is exactly what they want. Uh, in order to do it. I mean, to say that you, here's, here's the thing. I don't care if you were successful before. I, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it's like the, it's like the, the, the guy in sports who won a championship 10 years ago and they're still reliving that championship. Like what the fuck have you done lately? Like forget about the championship 10 years ago. It doesn't matter. The past is over. The, the, it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad. It's in the past. What are you going to do right now? That's it. Dream for now Make a decision now. Own the reason that you want it. I had somebody say to me, um, I, you know, I'm really afraid to be successful because uh, my husband is not on, page, on the same page with me, and I'm afraid of what that's going to mean if I continue to grow. And I said, what do you mean you're afraid of what that's going to mean? And she's like, well, because we'll probably end up getting divorced. I'm like, do you want to get divorced? Yeah. And then well, what the hell are you afraid of it for? Like, then just, if that's what you want to do, admit it and go do it. You can't drag people with you. What do you do to get your husband involved? What do you do to get your wife involved? Like, pick what you want and go after it. Go after it. I mean, life is short. Live it. Do it. Make a decision and don't look back. Never look back. You know, that's why I love to throw that, that quote from the Bible on there about when, uh, uh, Lot and his wife were leaving Gomorrah and God told, told them not to turn around and, and Lot's wife turned around. She was turned into a pillar of salt. It is such a great metaphor that there's like the past freezes you in your tracks forever. As long as you look back, it's over. I mean, it's done. You're frozen by your past. Move forward. Thanks, David. Another yeah. question from Bria. Can you please elaborate on the law of cause and effect? Everything I want is here. I understand that. But how do I bring it into physical existence or call it into manifest into the physical realm? So you, you decide what you want, right? So let's say a person wants to be a millionaire. Um, a, being a millionaire is the effect of something. So if you have a business, you're looking at uh, how many products do I need to sell at what price? And then what action do I need to take to do that? What is my marketing needs to be? How many sales do I need to do? And how much activity do I need to do each day in order to be a millionaire by this date? So you pick a date and, and that's what it is. And then you do the cause and effect of that to work you know, to that date. And it's the same thing with anything. I don't care whether you want to lose weight. It's like you adjust your food, you increase your, your activity, and you work on it every single day. If you want to become more athletic, you do whatever it is that you need to do to become more athletic. If you want to be a, bit, a better parent, you study how to be a better, a better parent, and then you behave that every day. It, what, you want to learn to fly an airplane, you go to flight school, and you do the things that they tell you to do every single day until you master those things. With success, that's why like, there is no recipe for success. It's like success in what? The what is the most important part, right? What is it that you want to do and what is the outcome? You have to be crystal clear on the outcome in order to know what activities uh, are going to create that outcome. Thank you. Next question. This is from Vanessa. You said that you were giving everything you could in the bubble of safety. What change did you make after you had that realization? That's the, that's the, uh, the story about the dog. <laughs> that's, that's the, the Herbie, Herbie story. story. That's, the, that's the Herbie story. Yeah. So um, just, just like to make this really, really short, there was, a, I had this experience right at this time, by the way, where I was selling, um, 
I was selling these uh, these healthcare products, and the company that I was working with had a a, a healthcare product for a dog that would that would help uh, an arthritic dog be in less pain. And I had a friend who had a dog that all the kids in the neighborhood loved. His name was Herbie. And he was, he was getting older. He was, having, he was having some pain. And I asked him, I said, listen, why don't you buy this? It'll really help your dog. And I was told no. And I thought it was very interesting because they loved this dog. The dog used to walk around the block. They were pulling it in a, in a wagon, you know, and I'm like, what the hell's the matter with the dog? And they're like, well, you know, the dog's got, you know, sore hips or, or whatever. And I'm like, listen, try this thing. It'll really help. And they, no, they're not going to do it. So I was like, okay, no problem. And then I went to this conference and I was talking to this guy and it wasn't about that situation. It was just about the, the success that I was having in general. And that's when he told me I didn't want it bad enough. And I realized that every time a person told me no, they were giving me a reason that I believed. And what I, what I was hearing was the story about why they couldn't do something. And I wouldn't challenge it. I never, ever challenged it. So I thought to myself, oh, that's bullshit. I'm not challenging it because I don't want to piss them off. So I decided that I, like, I, the same day that I drove home from that conference, I walked in my house, I got that product, I walked across the street to George and Sandy's house, I knocked on his door, he opened the door, he saw the product in my hand, he said, I already told you, and I put my foot in the door, I said, give me five minutes. I walked in the house and I said, George, I'm not leaving here till you give me a check for $167 for this. He said, listen, I told you. He said, listen, he said, here's the deal. He said, Herbie is a little incontinent and I'm afraid he's going to pee on the pad. So he didn't tell me that the first time. He just said, no, apparently there was something about that, that he had some embarrassment around. I said, I don't care if he destroys the whole thing. I'll, I'll buy it if he does, or if it doesn't work, I'll totally give you your money back. I said, but I'm not leaving until you give me a check because you're going to try this for the dog. He opened up his checkbook. He wrote me a check. A week later, the dog was walking down the street again. And it was like, bingo, I got it. Don't believe in somebody else's story to be 100% true. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you if a person really doesn't want something, get away as fast as you can, go find somebody that does, right? I believe in, in, in working the numbers and fight finding people that are already a yes and helping them step further into their yes, not trying to turn a real no into a yes. But the truth is, is in sales is that the hardest thing for most people to do is to tell somebody else no, so they lie. And the, you have to find out if the lie is a real no or is it a yes in disguise. And that's a very important skill a salesperson needs to know. And if you do it long enough, you can tell. You can just feel it. You can tell by the way a person's behaving. You can tell by the conversation. And you know whether to just shut it down and get the hell out of there. Or you know whether to, to try to find out what is the person having a hard time saying yes about. And then if you can help them say yes, you not only have you done them a service, you've done yourself a service and you're, and you're building, you're building a, a magnificent business and relationship with people. So that's, that's what it is. Thanks, David. This next question is from Christine. How is it that a person of mediocrity or a person in a fog can influence people around them to also be in a fog? Because if you're in a fog, what you're really doing is you're saying safety is more important to me than walking through the fog without a light. And so everybody else then learns by your behavior. Well, you're not doing it and you're not doing it. All mediocre people have mediocre people around them that are doing or not doing the same damn things. So they, you know, when we want to be successful, one of the things that we do as human beings is we look for a reference. We look for something outside of us that says we could do this, right? So and that's why people have heroes, right? Which I think is a great thing. That's why kids look up to movie stars and, 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 and sports athletes and, you know, astronauts and all kinds of stuff. We all have our heroes in life. And we look for anything that resembles ourself in those individuals. Well, when you're mediocre, you're looking at the people that are around you and that resembles yourself. So it, there's nothing there that resembles success for a person. So if you're just looking around in that fog, you don't see anything else and everybody stays the same. Nobody else grows. So we, we all need those people of inspiration to help us believe in something beyond our own current situation. And damn it, you've got to find a selfish reason why you want success. You really, really do. 
because you're not going to get out of it unless, un, unless you, 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 you truly want something for you. Anything that you want for you, you can't get for you without giving to other people. That's an automatic law. Even though most people will try to get without giving, it's an impossibility. Unless you're going to steal something, you can't do it. So, but you have to give to yourself first. If you don't have anything to give to be the success that you want, you've got to consume something that allows you to turn that into something to give and then go back out and give it to the world. Thank you. Next question is from Becca. Hi, David. Wow, you called my bullshit out. When I was thinking, why do I want what I want? I was initially thinking, I want to help people know, I want to help people make a massive impact, yada, yada, yada. That's not a selfish reason. How can I connect to the selfish truth of my desires? Be honest with yourself about what you want and why you want it. So, so, here, so here's the deal. When, when I, most people miss this about my story. When I broke out of it being in the trailer on the forklift, it was for a totally selfish reason. Like I couldn't, I was so miserable. I was miserable. Yes, my family was miserable. Yes, we were living in a shit place, but I was miserable. I hated what I did. I don't know how many, I've said that a million times over the last 25 years. I hated, 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 hated what I did. I wanted to change that experience more than anything. I also wanted to change it for my family. The helping other people didn't come for years. It didn't come for years down the road that, that I wanted to actually help other people. It was after I helped myself get out of the situation that I was in that I actually saw that I had a gift that I could actually help other people with. That's what enlightened me to it. I think when people say, I just want to help other people and they've done nothing to help themselves, what they're really saying is I want a lot of people to love me. So you need to look inside yourself because if you're saying that, I want to save the world, I want to have a lot of fans, I want a lot of people to love, I want to help a lot of people, you really want a lot of people to love you. That's the problem. Because when you start to be a success, unfortunately, what happens first is a lot of people don't love you. They don't because you get a lot of no's in the beginning. And you, people may have heard this before. You can, you'll, you'll hear this in books. You'll hear it in some movies. You'll hear it in some documentaries. Have you ever been at that point in your life where poverty was like unmovable, right? I was. Like when I was, on, when I was, when I was in that trailer, when I was on the forklift, it was like poverty was unmovable. It was, it was everywhere. It was around. I couldn't get away from it. I couldn't get under it. I couldn't get over it. Like it would not budge for years. It just wouldn't budge. I don't care how hard I worked, how many jobs I had, it would not move. And I have heard that saying from many, many people that have had that experience. Like they were in a part of their life where, and it could be poverty, it could be relationship problems, it could be health issues or whatever. It's like the fucking problem we're having is unmovable. It is just not budging no matter what we do. It's there, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there. The idea in that moment is to try to get you to wake up to who are you being that's keeping that thing there, right? And, and here's the truth that, that nobody ever wants to hear. It's because it's the thing that you're most familiar with is the reason that it's there. So you hold on to it more than you want what you say you want. The only way we ever get away from it is getting to the point where like I've had enough. I've absolutely had enough. I'm not doing this anymore. I don't care what it costs. I don't care what it takes. I don't care who I have to walk away from. I am not doing this again. And that's when it's like, boom, that door opens and we see an opportunity to do something different. But until you get that tired of being in whatever situation you're in, it's going to stick. It's going to stick like somebody poured honey all over your body. Like it ain't coming off. It, it's, it's an awful place to be in. But the truth is, you really want it to be there more than you want something else. Thank you. Next question. I feel like I could go like run a 5K right now and I hate running. So I don't know what, I don't know if you've had like extra coffee today or what's happening, but I think everyone listening to this is having the same experience. Um, question. This is from Yvonne. Steph I got David. some rest is what it was. Is what? <laughs> I said I got some rest. Yeah. That's what it was. I got tired there for a while, but I'm cool now. <laughs> Steph, David, can I still, I can still go after the desire I had before COVID-19, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. Yvonne, 
I've spoken to you and people are waiting for you to go after your desire. Like get on it already. The, the, the virus, it, it really shouldn't be holding anybody back. I mean, you have a computer and you have a phone. You could reach anybody on the planet. What, what's to hold you back from? Like, you may have to do things different for a while, but it's not holding me back. The people that I'm working with when we're doing our blind spot breakthrough calls, which a lot of you have done, we're showing them how it doesn't need to hold them back. Like, I know lots of people that are making a lot of money right now. It, it, this doesn't have to hold anybody back from anything. You know, even if you have a restaurant, you know, it, you know um, Arjun and I covered this on a podcast the other day. It doesn't have to hold them back. It, it's really understanding that the only thing that holds you back is in your own head, not the situation. This situation should be one of the greatest catalysts for everybody listening to this that's ever happened in their life because it'll show you how to be resourceful if you'll let it, if you'll use it for that instead of, you, instead of using it for self-pity. There's a lot of people using it for self-pity right now, which is unfortunate. Yes. Okay, last question. This is from Mike. David, you told me a story a couple of years ago about walking away from your paying job based on advice you got from Bob. Can you say more about that moment and how you then pivoted into self-development? Well, actually, so I had been studying self-development for seven years before that moment. But Bob was the one that called me on my bullshit uh, one day when we were in New Orleans. And what he said to me was, I thought, I didn't think I could do what I wanted to do based on where I was in the moment, meaning that I was, I was, in a career. I was in an I was in a advancing career. I was doing very well. Um, but I, I had never run a business either. So it was literally walk away from the career and start this business. I knew that there was no way for me to bridge it back then. Um, it needed to be all in. And I was afraid. I was really afraid to, to be able to do that. So it, I, had, I probably had, should, had, should have done it like a year before that I actually did it because I didn't tell him that I was struggling with it in my mind. And uh, we met in New Orleans at a speaking event and he said to me, just quit. And I said, and I, what I went to say to him was that there were all these things that I needed that I didn't have. And the, the gist of the conversation was this, you're not gonna get any of those fucking things until you make the decision to do it because the decision, decision comes first. When you make the decision, then you set everything in motion to get what you want, but you don't need to get it because you haven't made a decision. So it was make the decision. So that's what I did. I quit and I, and I started. Like it was that October. I quit and started and, and never looked back. Thanks, David. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. We were seeing ticket sales come in. So our face shield number, our building, I just received a um, suggestion from someone on here to add the, the face shield count to our watch party page. That's a great idea. I don't know why I didn't think of that. I'm going to do it. <laughs> so nice. thank you. Um, Sarah's just posted the link again. You'll have to copy it and paste it in your browser. I don't think the link is, is clickable. I'll also be sending out some more emails this week, both on Wednesday and Friday, um, just giving you some more information about the watch party and all the value David's going to bring while also giving back to our frontline healthcare workers in New York City. Until next week, everyone, the replay will be in your inbox by 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Please be well and stay in touch. Bye, everybody. Bye for now. Hey, if you like this video, make sure you share it on social and don't forget to subscribe to the channel.